you have spent time, in, well, all of you spent time in a variety of camps, but one of those was the camp made famous by the movie The Great Escape. Can you all tell us anything about, and, and again, I think Rudy, you might have even had some involvement in a still made in, in that camp, but can you give us a little insight from somebody who was actually there when the escape occurred? Well, I should mention, I was a prisoner of war for 601 days. I had never counted the number of days until after the Gulf War when they started saying that they were prisoners for eight days and nine days. And then the VA asked us to say the number of days we were prisoners, not the two, two years or the one and a half years, but they asked to actually say the number of days. Oh, before I go into that, I'm just going to mention something briefly you said about we were young and uh, had a lot of vigor and all that. We were in this camp, and there was a big rumor around that they were feeding us saltpeter to keep our libido down. And I know for a fact that they did because it's working now. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you were asking about the great escape. Um, the, uh, the, the barracks I was in, they were tunneling out of it. The British were in our camp at first, and then they moved into the north camp. But uh, they had a tunnel area that went out of our barracks, and it was actually a tunnel area that they used it, uh, in the north camp. And they named them Tom, Dick, and Harry. They had three, three code names for the tunnels. And uh, the other thing that I was going to mention about this was the fact that uh, we had a camp dance band that I played in the band, and I played trombone. And I played the college band before and after the war, and I still play trombone every Friday morning at the Shell Factory in Fort Myers. So if you're down there, come and dance to the music of our, our band. But we, uh, uh, I had this trombone, and, and then when I would practice in the barracks, it was quite terrible because it wasn't a good slide. And the guys were very annoyed. <laughs> just before Christmas, my horn disappeared. <laughs> and uh, I got a call on Christmas Eve, and they said, we found your horn. And they took me over to this other barracks. And here they had a still <laughs> used a big barrel. And they dumped raisins and sugar and, uh, and potato peelings. And they were making home brew with this thing. And at the top was my trombone, and then out of the mouthpiece was dripping some of the best beef. <laughs> <laughs> so when they filmed the, the movie The Great Escape, Wally Floody was the technical advisor to the film, and he remembered that it was my trombone, and so he called me. He said, you suppose you could come over to Munich and recreate that still? So I did. I went over there, and they were filming it just uh, on the west side of Munich, and they had built a replica of the camp. And, and Steve McQueen was there at the time, and, uh, but he wasn't very interested in the story. And Judy told me not to say bad things about Steve McQueen. <laughs> <laughs> but I felt that he kind of ruined the movie. He insisted on doing certain things that he did. Thank you very much, Rudy. I appreciate it. And, and thank you very much for overcoming your innate shyness. So. <laughs> <laughs> now, Rudy and George and Jack all flew bombers. They were all pilots of a bomber, which makes them unique in that they're responsible for nine other people. Our friend Ben here flew fighters. He flew a P-51D model fighter. You can see one outside on the hangar floor. Now, you all were in a position where you had to set down an enemy territory. Ben, in your case, you were on a strafing run and sustained damage to your coolant lines and your engine. Can you tell us about that incident when you realized the plane's not going to make it back home? Well, as soon as I was hit by any aircraft fire right in the engine, it killed the engine. So I knew that plane wasn't going anywhere. I had to land it there. And so I just cut the fuel off to keep gas from going to the engine and more setting on fire. And I flew over top of one power line and under another and turned and, and went back up along the track that I've been making approaches to the straight field. And when I got near the road where the house, out from town and houses along it, and the houses backed up to these fields that were planted in millet or something and cut off about six inches high. And 
a lot of people were standing around out there back of the house, hundreds of them just looking and like it was an air show or something. And I thought, well, you people must be crazy. There's a war going on and you could get shot and killed. I don't know what you're out here for. And so anyway, to keep from running into houses along that road, I made a left-hand turn and, and of course, remember, I was going down all the time because I didn't have any power and held the plane off, wheels up, and when the last prop turned over and bent, while the plane just stood a little on its nose and settled back down, but uh, I forgot to lock my seat belt, uh, alongside my seat belt, the lock that locked my shoulder harness to keep him moving forward when he stopped suddenly. And, but I didn't do that, so when I moved forward, why well, there's a gun sight right here in front of my face, and it smashed right into my face, knocked me a little bit uh, out of it, and, but I shook my head and cleared my head and, and thought, well, this uh, 351 might be on fire, but I'm not going to sit here and roast in it if I have to shoot the canopy off, because I had a 45 semi-automatic pistol and shoulder holster. But I reached over and got a hold of the crank to operate the canopy and turned it and it just rolled back like nothing ever happened to it. And I, I loosened my seat belt and that loosened my shoulder arm so I hooked into it and threw it to one side and then took my oxygen mask and took it off through threw blood all over the cockpit but I looked to the uh, left and there was soldiers about 100 yards away running toward me with bayonets on, on rifles that were on, on their shoulder. And so I got off the other side of the airplane and, and of course the wings were right down flat on the ground. But got off there and got out and, and run alongside those people that were standing out there looking. And, managed to get my May West off so I didn't have to run the bed on and I, I run on to the, the corner and turned like this and I knew where I was going because I was familiar with the ground below when I was flying and as I turned the corner not far away from that someone was yelling stop stop so I finally said well, I better look and see what's happening so I turned back and looked and there was a young teenage German soldier uh, running after me, waving his pistol. He had a small pistol and, and young stock. And then I looked at these guys with the bayonets were right along behind him. And I thought, well, this is not an uh, even situation here. It isn't one guy shooting another. <laughs> it would be about five of them shooting me and me shooting one uh, gun. And I decided to stop him. I stopped him by that time he was up with me and he held a gun on me and, and said, have you got a weapon? And I looked at him and said, where did you learn to speak English? He says, oh, if you have to learn in school. And so I said, yes, I've got a weapon. I unzipped my jacket and it, and it fell apart and you could see the gun on the shoulder over here. And he took that and then he wanted the holster and tried to get it off. I said, wait, I have to take the shot out of this to get a jacket to get this uh, thing over my head and out. And uh, I gave him that and then he said, if you got any other weapons, I pointed to my boot and showed him the knife that I had in the case and stuck in the tip of the boot. And uh, he reached down and, and took the knife and he was going to cut the leather cords up holding the case, the case to my ankle. And I said, wait, and, and he uh, looked up at me and stood up, and uh, I just reached down and jerked the leather loose and, and picked up a uh, sheath and handed it to them. Thank you very much. I appreciate you sharing that story, Ben. And just uh, maybe as a little point of interest, this experience wasn't just profoundly important to Ben. Because he told you that there was a crowd of people standing on the side of that field where he had the forced landing. 
in that crowd was a 12-year-old boy who remembered this for years. And Ben's wife shared this story with me. We know that's true because that boy from Czechoslovakia emigrated to the United States later on. And he wrote down the serial number of that crashed airplane he saw that day. And he searched and he searched and eventually he found Ben. And they actually got to meet. So these, these little events, these things that happen in wartime, when the entire world has gone insane, really make an impact on individual people that lasts for decades. They remember these things.